Okay, hi everyone. This is going to be the PowerPoint lecture for Chapter 7. We're going to be looking at inventory and cost of goods sold. Okay? So, kind of the layout of this chapter, we're going to first look at the nature of inventory and you know, what is cost of goods sold. Then we'll then look at inventory costing methods. Afterwards, we'll check out uh, valuing of inventory at the lower of cost or net realizable value. And after that, we'll look at, hey, how can we properly evaluate uh, our inventory, manage it, what techniques can we have? And finally, we'll look at some controls over inventory. All right, as a starting point, right, we have seen in this class that there's inventory. Right? That's what your business sells. If you ever go in you know, to a business and you buy something, you're buying their inventory. Or they say, hey, we're short on inventory. Right? It's what they sell. Um, so the formal definition, right? it's going to be tangible property held for sale in the normal course of business. Um, or it's going to be used to produce goods or services for sale. In short, your inventory is what you sell. It's normally going to be a current asset. Now, when we're talking about businesses, right, and their inventory, you really have two ways you can categorize them. You have like a merchandiser versus a manufacturer. Okay, so a merchandiser, this is somebody who buys the inventory from an external source and then sells it. Okay, so here's like an example. Walmart, right, if you walk into Walmart uh, and you see a t-shirt hanging on a rack, Walmart didn't make that t-shirt, right? They bought it from like a third party company, maybe for $10 and then uh, Walmart wa marks it up, you know, to have a profit percentage. Maybe they sell it for $20, okay? That would be the idea of a merchandiser. Um, and what I have there is goods held for resale in the normal course of business. They basically just buy finished goods, right? They buy a finished t-shirt from the t-shirt company. In distinction, right, we have manufacturers, right? They actually produce the inventory that they sell, right? So uh, maybe you have a company that makes, um, I don't know, let me think here, any real manufacturer, right? If we were looking at that t-shirt company, right? So uh, you know, they actually produce the t-shirts, so they have their raw materials, right? Like the cotton, the other items that go into it, the ink, the coloring. Then they're going to have their work in process, right? This is like the t-shirt that's been started, but it hasn't been finished yet, right? So maybe it's like, uh, you know, all put in t-shirt form, but we haven't put the screen graphics on it yet. And then they'll have their finished goods inventory, right? The t-shirt's done, it's ready to go. Uh, that you know, type of business where the product they're selling, they make it, the t-shirt company, that's called a manufacturer, right? You make something. Maybe you manufacture t-shirts, you manufacture bricks, right? You manufacture soda. Um, you make it, right? You formulate it, you create it, you take it from basically raw materials to a finished product. What we're going to be looking at in this chapter more involves merchandisers, right? So the Walmarts of the world, they buy merchandise and then they sell it, right? They buy a finished t-shirt, they sell it. Walmart isn't in the business of making t-shirts. Uh, they buy them and sell them for a profit. Manufacturing inventory, right? Your raw materials, your whip and your finished goods. The study of that where you're really gonna look at that is managerial accounting. So that's like the course after financial accounting. It's a uh, you know, very different course than financial. Uh, if you like financial accounting, you may not like managerial. The reverse is true too. Some people don't like financial, but then they do like managerial. It's a different setup there. But in this chapter, right, we're going to just be focusing on merchandisers, the Walmarts, the companies that buy it and then sell it. All right, so when you buy inventory, right, debit inventory. Uh, now the number that you're gonna put in there in that debit, uh, inventory is gonna be included at cost 
Now what that means is basically the sum or the total of all of the costs you know, necessary to bring the item to a usable sale or condition. Right, so that's gonna include things like cost, shipping, any you know, inspections or things like that. Basically anything until the inventory is up on the shelf, right in our store being ready to sold, all of those costs ready to sell it, buying it, shipping, etc. that would be our inventory. Right, so it would be like if you bought something off uh, eBay, right? Maybe you spent $100 and then $15 on shipping, you would do debit inventory for 115, right? It would be the cost plus the shipping. Now the idea here is we kind of have some general journal entries and some of these we've seen before with an inventory kind of that two part journal entry uh, on the back end when you sell it, but at a front end, right? When you purchase inventory, you debit inventory, credit cash. When you sell it, you take the expense, right? Debit cost of goods sold, credit inventory, you'd have a separate journal entry for the sales revenue from it, right? But that's the idea. The general rule, when you buy inventory, you capitalize it, put it on the balance sheet. You don't take the expense then, you defer it, right? You wait until later on when you sell it to take the expense. There's a similar setup for manufacturers, right? For how they do this, they're gonna capitalize and break out their inventory into you know, different components. Uh, but at the same point in time, the idea with both is going to be when you sell inventory, that's when you take the expense, right? Debit, cost of goods sold. And what that really means is you're taking an expense, so it's going to be a debit. And what it's for is for the cost of those goods you sold, right? So if Walmart sells a t-shirt for $20, that they bought for $10, when they buy it, they would do debit inventory 10, credit cash 10. When they sell it, right, for 20, first journal entry they would do is the sales revenue, right, like debit cash 20, credit sales revenue 20, but then they would do the subsequent journal entry for the expense, right, debit cost of goods sold 10, right, that cost of the t-shirt, the cost of the goods we sold was 10, credit inventory 10, get it off the balance sheet. Now with inventory, right, you're gonna need to know the T account for it, right? So it's gonna be your beginning plus your purchases minus your cost of goods sold, right? Because whenever you take that, you're crediting inventory, right? You're getting rid of it, is gonna give you your ending, right? So it's, imagine you started with 100, you bought 25, that's gonna give you goods available for sale when you're, you're like max capacity, $125. Back out your ending inventory of 40, you're gonna have cost of goods sold of 85, right? You can just think of it like this, right? If you started over here with four units of inventory, right? Then you bought one, two, three, four, five, six, right? At your max capacity, you're gonna be at nine there. Here we are at the end of the period, right? You have three left. Well, if at your max capacity you were at nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten, I must have counted wrong. One, two, three, four, five, six. Not a big deal. Six plus four, max capacity ten. At the end of the day, you only have three left, right? That means you must have sold seven. Okay, so first off, let's just understand the flow, right? Imagine that you were selling something, Pokemon cards, whatever it is, right? And it's all like a homogeneous product, the same item, right? You start with four, you buy six, you're at 10. Of that 10, right at the end of the period, you either kept it or you sold it, you got rid of it. Now that's just showing you the flow of inventory, right? Like the beginning plus purchases minus cost of goods sold equals ending. That's you know, just rearranging you know, the formula there. But whenever we do the T account, right? We put those numbers in there. You're not, bit, you're not putting it like per units, right? Like two blocks beginning. Instead, it has to be expressed in dollars, right? Now, the dollars, they can be given to you, right? Like maybe you had $100 of beginning inventory 
or you'll have to solve for it, right? You had 10 units, 10 blocks, right, that each cost you $10, your beginning inventory would be 100, right? So blocks can help you understand the physical flow of what's going on, but it has to be in dollars, right, when you populate the T account. And that can be given to you, or you'll have to calculate it. All right, with inventory, right, we're going to have two different inventory methods, right? There's a perpetual inventory method versus a periodic inventory method. So a perpetual inventory method, the idea with this is, this is going to be an inventory system in which detailed inventory records are maintained. Uh, basically, each time we have a purchase and sale during the accounting period, we are going to update our inventory levels. Right, so when we purchase it, bam, we update our inventory levels. When we sell it, right, we update our inventory levels. Uh, this is very common, you know, in storage, right? That's why they have like the little you know, trackers and the scan guns where every time you check out, right, they can edit their inventory levels, do the journal entry for it. In distinction, right, another inventory system or method we can have here is a periodic inventory method. And the idea with this is, instead of every single time we have a sale, we update our inventory method, we essentially, or we update our inventory levels, we essentially wait until the end of the period, and at that time, update our inventory levels based on a physical count. Now, the idea with where you would use a periodic inventory method, this would be for a nature of a business or a setup where you can't really uh, you know, judge items as they go through bit by bit. Uh, and under this system, right, you cannot uh, you know, determine your ending inventory level until the end of the period. So that kind of leaves you a little bit uh, you know, hazy in the period for where are we with our inventory. Okay, so in the first example we looked at, we were uh, you know, assuming a fixed cost to inventory. Those blocks 10 bucks each, right? So you could just you know, do the math, add it up, you could populate your T account. However, right, this isn't the case in the real world, right? It's not always uh, gonna be the same cost of something if you buy it from one month to the next, right? There's inflation, there's supply and demand, various factors that could influence, right? So. Uh, that's the idea with inventory. You have to be aware of the physical flow, the blocks, and you assign a cost. When you assign the cost, you really have to look at and see what did the inventory cost. It's not always going to be stagnant, a fixed flat $10 per unit. All right, so to illustrate this, right, let's imagine that we have a hardware store and they make three orders for the same exact nails. Right, so they buy a 10 pound bag of nails for 25 cents a pound. Later on, they buy a 15 pound bag of nails for 40 cents a pound. And then they buy a 12 pound bag of nails at 50 cents per pound, right? Three different orders for the same item. Maybe there was inflation, right? The idea is as time passes, uh, we're paying more cents per pound, right? The cost was increasing from one purchase to the next. And the idea with this, these is we run a hardware store. Maybe we just have a big bin or a barrel at the front of the store. We just dump all these nails into there, right? Now, this kind of system, it's not really going to lend itself uh, well to a perpetual inventory system, right? Because we aren't putting UPC labels on each of those nails, right? You just kind of scoop them out, put them in a bag, and then they weigh them up front and charge it, right? So what we have to do here then is kind of implement a periodic inventory system. So at the end of the period, right, we're gonna go and do a um, analysis of how much nails we have left, right? So we go over to that bin and we weigh it. We say, hey, we have five pounds of nails left, right? So Here's the problem with this though, right? So it's kind of like this guy over here, right? We started with this, we bought some more nails at our max capacity, the bin was filled with this. At the end of the period, we see we have you know, five pounds of nails left, which means we must have sold a certain amount. 
but here's the deal, right? How do we know, right, those nails that are in there, what was the cost of them, right? Because a nail is a nail, right? It's a very homogeneous product. You can't just like pick one up and say, oh, well, that came from the 10 pound purchase or the 15 pound purchase. They all look exactly alike, right? And customers are kind of rooting through there, they get mixed up. So uh, what would we do here? All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is, right, we're gonna use the inventory equation, right? So we started with zero, we bought 37 pounds, 10, 15, and 12. At our max capacity, we had 37 pounds in there. We had five left at the end of the period, which means, hey, we must have sold 32 pounds. Next, right, we're gonna use an inventory costing method to help us assign cost to what we sold and what we have left, okay? And the four inventory costing methods are gonna be specific ID, FIFO, LIFO, and average cost, right? So kinda sort it out uh, by the flow, beginning plus purchases equals goods available for sale, your max capacity minus ending, which means you must have sold. Then in there, right, you have to assign a cost to it. And because these are all mixed up and jumbled, uh, you know, it, it, it will be hard to do that, right? So there's different techniques we can use to help us assign costs. So this is just the theory of it, right? If you can understand this theory right now of, you know, the nails being mixed up and we can't really, you know, look at them uh, and, and get a cost, that's the problem we're trying to resolve. And how we resolve it is through uh, you know, these assumptions and these different methods we're going to have. All right, so to show us how the methods work, right, through way of an example, uh, let's assume the following facts, right? So first off, we're a merchandiser, right? We, looks like we buy and sell jackets. And at the beginning of the period, right, January 1st, we had two jackets in our store that each cost us 70 bucks when we bought it. Okay, week or so later, right, we buy four more units of the jacket at 80 bucks, right, the price has gone up. Uh, you know, the middle of the month, we buy one more, the price, you know, 100 bucks, this must be, you know, a highly inflationary product, or maybe it's really in demand. And then, hey, right, looks like we sold four of the jackets for 120, right, so we had a beginning, plus some purchases, and then we sold four of the jackets, right? So we're gonna do here, right, the flow, and then assign a cost, right? And the first cost we're gonna look at here is our specific ID, right? And under the specific ID, under this method, you're really just gonna specifically ID what you sold versus what you kept, right? In this case, we're not dealing with that many jackets, right? Like in total, there was two, then four, so like seven jackets, right? Uh, we sold four of them. We could pretty easily, you know, identify in that case, which jackets we sold versus which jackets we kept in ending inventory, right? There's only seven of them. It's not like the big barrel of nails, right? Where there's like hundreds of nails in there. We're just dealing with seven. So in this case, Right, what we're gonna do here is, essentially, it looks like we sold in total, right, four units. So we would just ID, right, and this would be given to you, which ones they sold. So one plus two plus one, that's four. So it looks like one of the ones we sold came from the $70, right, from up here. Two of them we sold cost us $80 from there. And then two we sold came from the hundred dollars, right? So you would just do the one times 70 gives you 70, two times 80 gives you 160, right? Cross it, cross multiply, and then foot it, right? Add it down for 330 cost of goods sold, right? So if we sold four, right? We were at seven at our max, that means we must have kept three Right, so we would just specifically ID, well, hey, one of the ones we have left, I know we paid 70 bucks for that thing. Two of the items we have left, we paid 80, add it up. 
right? So the idea with specific ID is, yeah, put it into the flow, and when you assign costs, just you know, identify literally what it costs you. You could pick it out, right? Now the idea with specific ID is it's best suited for very specific or unique items, right? If you were selling like houses or jewelry, right? It's like not many of them. It's you know very easy to track and identify. Where it becomes you know a problem and you couldn't use this is like the barrel of nails, right? There's just too many of them. In those situations where you couldn't specifically ID what's going on, you're gonna use a different cost flow approach for assigning cost to inventory. That is to say one of the remaining three methods. Right, so with our FIFO, our LIFO, and our average cost, these are considered cost flow methods. And really we're just making an assumption here. We're doing the best we can uh, given the constraints of the situation. And we're gonna base our analysis on the physical flow of goods, right? So this isn't actual, right, the ones we sold or we had left, but we're just gonna take a stance and say, uh, you know, we're gonna take a first in approach, a last in approach, or an average cost approach. Right, so using that jacket example, right? So here's the idea with it. The first method we're gonna use here is FIFO, right? First in, first out. FIFO, <laughs> okay? I feel like I'm like uh, you know, talking with my little niece. She's you know kind of pronounces things like FIFO, FIFO, breaks out words like that. She's you know cute little niece. But under FIFO, right, our first in is our first out when we're assigning cost of goods sold. That is to say, the oldest stuff, the first stuff we bought, that's the first one we're going to assume or make the assumption that we sold. Right, so imagine that you um, you know, had Pokemon cards, right? And you know, when I was a kid, they had like the base set, and then there was like a jungle set, and then there was a like fossil set, right? They're like out the wazoo now with all of the sets. If I just mixed up all those Pokemon cards together, right, and then I started to sell them, and let's just say it was all the same Pokemon card, we don't need to get into the specifics. If I took a first in, first out approach, and I said, oh, it looks like at the end of the day, I must have sold 10 cards and I have three that are remaining. Those 10 that I sold, I'm going to say they came from the base set, right? The oldest. Those were the initial ones, right? It's like original Mario on NES, Super Nintendo, N64, right? We're going to just assume the first one we sold is the oldest, that NES one, the base set. First in, first out. Cost of goods sold. Right, so what that also means is if the oldest stuff we sold, it went out the door, that means the newest stuff, right, the fossil set, whatever the newest fancy Pokemon cards is, the you know, Wii or Switch or you know, whatever newest Nintendo system, that's what we have left. Right, so here, right, we know from the past example that we sold four and we have three left. Right, that's just like step one, put the blocks out there, separate it. Here's step two when we assign costs, right? If we're using FIFO, first in the oldest are gonna be our cost of goods sold, right? So here, right, if we look at all our jackets, the oldest, our first in, the first ones we ever bought, our initial ones, we're gonna draw from here first, right? So two from there and then two from here, right? So two at 70 and then two at 80. Right, so two at 70, two at 80, multiply, foot it, 300 bucks. Whatever's left, right, it looks like we're gonna have three left. Two of them are gonna come from the middle, and then one, that's gonna be that last purchase we made. Right, add it over, foot it. Right, so basically, figure out cost of goods sold based on the oldest. Then whatever's left over, right, the newest inventory is gonna be your ending inventory. Right, this is just showing it, right? It's like oldest, oldest, newest, draw from the oldest first, right? First in, first out, when we're establishing costs of goods sold, right? So we kind of have it in units, in dollar amounts, and then you know, how we would assign it. Now LIFO in distinction is the reverse, right? Our last in, 
is going to be our first out for purposes of cost of goods sold. In other words, our newest stuff, the last stuff we just bought, right? That's going to be where we draw from and you know, we're going to make the assumption that that's what we sold first, right? This is a cost flow approach. It's based on an assumption, not based on you know, actually what we sold, but it's just the best we're gonna do, right? So in this case, right, if we are using LIFO, right, we're gonna do last in, first out, gives us cost of goods sold. Well, the last one we purchased is from here, right? And I think we gotta take care of four that we sold. Well, one comes from this $100 batch, and then three are gonna come from the next, you know, purchase here, we go back, right? The three from the 80 bucks. All right, so for LIFO, one, our oldest, or I'm sorry, our newest, three from the next newest, gives us our cost of goods sold, right? Whatever is left over then, namely our oldest inventory, is gonna be our ending inventory, right? So it's like sorted, you know, step one, figure out the blocks, right? What are the units that we sold? What are the units we started with? What's our ending inventory? Step two, assign costs. If it's specific ID, it will specifically tell you what you sold and what you kept, the cost of it. If it's FIFO, the first in, namely your oldest inventory, is gonna be the first to represent your cost of goods sold. Your remaining inventory, namely your newest inventory, will be your ending inventory. If it's LIFO, last in, first out, then it's the reverse. Your newest inventory is gonna be the first you associate cost of goods sold, and your oldest inventory is gonna be your ending inventory. If you just memorize one of them, right, like FIFO, then LIFO is the reverse, okay? All right, so with LIFO here, last in, our first out. Right, then you move over to the left. So start over here, move over. Likewise, right, the last kind of cost flow method here is we can use an average cost to help us determine our cost of goods sold. Right, so under the average cost, we're basically going to do just that, right? Find the average. So in this case, right, we need to figure out our total costs and our total units. Right, so in this case, we started with 140 in beginning inventory. Right, two at 140. And then we made purchases, four of 80 and one at 100. Right, so that must have been purchases. Right, so we started with 140, then we made uh, 420 of purchases. That means we had 560, our total goods available for sale. Right, so our total cost, all the triangles, right, all the blocks in the triangle, all in these jackets cost us 560 bucks, right, and uh, it was seven jackets, right, so total all in number 560 for total jackets. That means, hey, on average, each jacket cost us $80, right, so we know that we sold four and that there were three left. All we do in this case, right, is the four we sold times the average cost, gets us our cost of goods sold. Uh, the three that are left over times the average cost gets us our ending inventory. All right, so this is gonna be average cost in, average cost out. <clears throat> All right, so I have here Right, each of the four inventory methods conform with GAAP and US tax law. Under IFRS, you can't use LIFO. Here's kind of the question though, right? Which inventory method should managers select? Right, in other words, if I came to you and I said, all right, I know we're using a periodic inventory system, we're selling these nails, right? Um, and that we can use specific ID, FIFO, LIFO, or weighted average. Could you please tell me which of these is the best to pick, right? And you would say basically something along the lines of, well, it depends what kind of outcome you're trying to achieve, right? It's kind of like, uh, you know, playing a board game. You can understand the rules of the board game, right? You know, if you roll the dice, you do this, you, the end goal is to conquer all the land. 
But then there's the strategy of the board game, right? It's like using the rules and playing in the best, you know, most strategic way you can, right? So the idea with this is in order to kind of understand the impacts of FIFO, LIFO, weighted average, and specific ID, we kind of have to understand the, imp uh, you know, the consequences of it. So the first statement, right, if, if you just want like the quick and easy way to remember the impacts of these, you can remember these three statements and then reverse the underlying terms. But if you're trying to understand this, right, the first statement is this, right, the bigger the cost of goods sold, the lower the net income in inventory on the balance sheet, right, you're expensing more of the inventory. Uh, so the idea here is bigger expense, cost of goods sold, makes lower net income. Bigger expense, smaller income. All right, next thing here. When costs are rising, right? We saw that in the situation with the jackets, right? They rose from purchase to purchase. I think first it was like 70 bucks, then it went up to 80, then it went to 100, right? When costs are rising over the period, which tends to be the case, right? Costs generally don't go down, but it's possible. Uh, when costs are rising, LIFO, last in, first out, is going to have a higher cost of goods sold, which means that it's going to have a lower net income and inventory than FIFO, right? And the reverse is going to be true for FIFO, right? When costs are rising, FIFO produces a lower cost of goods sold and higher net income and inventory than LIFO. Right, so all you need to do is memorize these three statements and then reverse the underlying terms. That can kind of be like a cheat sheet for you. Right, so this is showing that. Right, so as a beginning point, we have all four methods here, right? Specific ID, FIFO, LIFO, average costs. And in the motorcycle jacket example, the costs are rising, okay? And the first thing we can see here, right, uh, the higher the cost of goods sold, the lower ending inventory, right? So here with 300, we have 260 in ending inventory. If that goes up, right, the cost of goods sold gets bigger, we're going to have a lower ending inventory. Same with net income, right? 300 uh, cost of goods sold is going to get us to 75 bucks. If we make that bigger, our net income is going to get smaller. That's kind of statement one. Right. Statement two says when costs are rising, which is this case, LIFO is going to have a higher cost of goods sold than FIFO. Right. So we have a rising cost scenario here. LIFO cost of goods sold is going to be higher than FIFO. Right. 340 is bigger than 300. You can see in turn right, our net income is going to be smaller and our ending inventory is going to be smaller. So basically, uh, right, you got to know how to calculate it, right, step one, step two, sort out the blocks, assign a cost using the four different methods, and then you have to understand how to analyze it, right? It's not enough just knowing how to do it. It's also understanding the differences between them, right? So that's, you know, kind of a sheet, cheat sheet there for rising inventory costs. And if inventory was decreasing, right? So if we get back to the idea of like the strategy component, right? Well, like which one should you pick? Well, there's a little bit of a tension here that's going on, right? So choice of method, whether you use FIFO, LIFO, weighted average, you really have to look at like what are your end goals and your preferences, right? Do you want uh, higher earnings on your financial statements? Or do you want to have the lowest income tax paid, right? So here's kind of the tension, right? To just under to explain to you what's going on. As a general rule, what businesses do, they produce financial statements, right? And they're going to show income on those financial statements. They then take those financial statements, modify them a little bit based on any tax rules, and then they produce and use that to pay their taxes. Right, so here's the tension that's going on in selecting a method. On the one hand, right, you're a business, you're, let's just say you're a big publicly traded business, you want to have 
as much income as you can, right? If you go on Shark Tank and you're saying, uh, you know, I have a you know, million dollars of net income, that's great, right? All the sharks are going to want to invest in you. But here's the downside of that, right? You got to then report a million dollars of taxable income that you got to pay tax on, right? That's like not a good thing. So with that, right, on the one hand, if you, your inventory method, if you're trying to maximize profits, that's great, but that's going to hurt you for taxes. On the other hand, if you select you know, a different inventory method, maybe it makes your net income on the books and records go down, but then you pay less taxes, right? So you don't look as good on paper, but you pay less taxes, right? So the idea with this is, you know, in selecting your inventory method, you have to realize are costs rising, are costs falling. If I pick FIFO, we're going to have you know more expense or less expense. In turn, my net income is going to get bigger or smaller, right? That may look good on the outside, but it's gonna we're going to have to pay tax on it, right? So, what are your goals and preferences as a business? You have to balance those. There's not a one size fits all answer. It all is like facts and circumstances specific. What you're trying to achieve. Now, one of the things you can do. Right, is you are allowed to use different methods for your financials versus the tax return. Uh, however, the IRS does say this, right? If you use LIFO on your tax return, then you must use LIFO for financial statements. Right, so in other words, you know, you can generally mix and match these, right? Use FIFO on your books, FIFO on uh, the tax return use LIFO on the books, use uh, FIFO on the tax return. But if at any point you use LIFO on your taxes, then you have to use LIFO for your financials, for your books and records, okay? And that's called the LIFO rule. All right, so we just talked about inventory in the sense of the different businesses of inventory, right? Merchandisers versus manufacturers. Then we looked at different types of inventory systems, right? A perpetual versus a periodic. Then we looked at kind of the inventory flow and assigning costs to it using one of those costing methods. Uh, so now we have at the end of the day, right? Our inventory on our balance sheet. Now, generally, right? That's gonna be at cost. Right, what you paid for it, and then how it's modified by virtue of uh, which inventory method you're using. So now, for example, what Gap says, right, once you have it on there at cost, you have to periodically revalue it. Right, so general rule, inventory is on the balance sheet at cost, historical cost, as kind of flowing through FIFO, LIFO, weighted average, right? We know what's on there, we did that. However, periodically, right, you have to compare that cost, that number, with something called the net realizable value. And then, right, whatever the lower of the two is, that's what you're gonna put at your inventory level. So general rule is cost, exception is, if net realizable value is lower than cost, then you write it down to net realizable value. So net realizable value basically just means, hey, what can you sell this for less any selling expenses, right? So maybe, for example, we have our inventory on our balance sheet at like 100 bucks or something, right? Uh, and maybe you could only sell it for $90, uh, but then you got to pay eBay a $5 fee, right? So in that case, it's really like your net realizable value would be 85 bucks. Right, the 90 minus the $5 fee. Well, if we have it on there at 100, but we can really only get 85 out, out of it, right, we gotta write it down. And in that way, we'll take a holding loss, right? So debit loss, credit inventory, write it down. So uh, that's the idea with inventory, right? Uh, talked about you know, the beginning of it, uh, measuring it. Uh, you know, cost, what that means. Once we get it on there, periodically have to re, uh, you know, reevaluate it. All 
All right, the last kind of part here that we're gonna look at is uh, errors in measuring inventory. Right, so let's say that there was an error, right? If cost of goods sold or ending inventory is over or understated, uh, what essentially happens with this is it's gonna correct itself over a two year period. In other words, right, let's say here in year one, right, so we have kind of our inventory, which is our beginning plus our purchases minus our ending, gives us our cost of goods sold, right? If in year one, say we screwed up in that, um, in this case, our ending inventory is going to be um, understated, right? So let me, right, this should be, overstated and this should be understated okay so in other words say that we screwed up our cost of goods or I'm sorry our ending inventory oh no, that was right I'm sorry this was right my bad <laughs> I thought this was ending inventory down here. Not that big of a deal, right? If we say that our ending inventory uh, in year one is overstated, right? Our ending, we screw that up. That's gonna flow over, right? And make our beginning inventory in year two overstated, right? Last year's ending is this year's beginning. If we're overstated at the end of last year, then we're gonna be overstated at the beginning of this year. Right, so if this guy is overstated, right, in year one, then it means our cost of goods sold must be understated, right? So uh, with that, right, the idea here is if we go through, right, if this is overstated by 500 bucks in year two, right, it's gonna correct itself, right? In other words, year one, cost of goods sold because it's understated, we're gonna have a higher net income. In year two, right, our cost of goods sold is gonna be overstated, which is gonna make a lower net income. In other words, at the end of the day, right, it's gonna cancel itself out, right? Our expense, you know, the effect of this, um, this too little of an expense here will be uh, canceled out at the end of the year two because the expense becomes too big there. All right, the ratio here, right, we're going to be looking at the inventory turnover ratio. This is reflecting how efficient, uh, you know, do you have the correct levels of inventory on hand? Well, you're minimizing the carrying cost. Uh, the company is at managing its inventory. And specifically, what we're looking at is how many times on average, right, is inventory produced and sold during the period. The higher the ratio, the better you are at managing your inventory. Right, so the idea here with the inventory turnover ratio, it's gonna be our cost of goods sold, right, our COGS and expense, over our average inventory, right, which is our beginning inventory plus our ending inventory divided by two, okay? So let's run through here real quick just to make sure that we're all on the same page. All right, so chapter seven, talking about inventory, right? Generally, it's gonna be the stuff you sell, your business, right? We said we have a merchandiser, like the Walmarts, right? They buy stuff and they mark it up, sell it at a profit. We have manufacturers, they produce their inventory, right? They make the t-shirts, they make uh, the coffee cups, they make the phones, right? Uh, with regard to merchandisers and manufacturers, generally you're gonna learn about, you know, uh, calculating costs of goods sold uh, for manufacturers in managerial accounting, right? In here, we're gonna be looking at merchandisers, right? When you buy inventory and then you sell it. And generally with inventory, the framework is gonna be that it's a um, deferred expense. In other words, 
When you buy inventory, debit inventory. Don't take the expense then. When you sell it on the back end, right, then you take the expense for the inventory. And that expense is known as cost of goods sold, COGS, right? Then we talked about the inventory equation, right? It's your beginning inventory plus what you bought minus uh, your ending inventory gives you what you sold. Or, you know, right, it's your beginning. So this is like how you solve for cost of goods sold right here. But the T account itself is the beginning plus what you bought minus what you sold gives you your ending. Rearranging that gets you to your cost of goods sold equation right there. Okay? And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? You started with 100, you bought 20, you sold 10. Hey, you must have 110 in ending inventory. We looked at that in kind of a flow, right? In kind of like a block, physical form. Uh, we said you have your beginning plus what you bought gives you your max goods available for sale. And from that, right, when you're at the end of the period, some of that you have left and some of it you must have sold. And when you're filling out that inventory T account, we said you don't just put in number of blocks, right? They wanna see it in dollar signs, dollar amounts. It could be given to you or you have to solve for it, right? This right here, we're just assuming a fixed $10 cost for inventory. But as we move forward, right, we're going to look at situations where inventory cost changes from purchase to purchase. It's not a flat 10 bucks, right? It goes from one uh, period to the next at different costs. We then said you have the perpetual inventory method. Every time you make a sale, update your inventory accounts versus the periodic inventory method where you wait until the end of the period, do a physical count of your ending inventory, and then back into your cost of goods sold. Uh, as I mentioned, right, inventory costs can change. We looked at the example there with the nails, right? You get the big bin of nails uh, that are comprised of three different purchases at three different costs. At the end of the day, we got you know, some nails left. We have the problem here. How do we assign the cost of these nails, right? We can't, the nails are like fungible. They're like almost exactly the same. Can't tell what purchase they came from, right? So we're giving you a two-step process here for these situations, right? Step one is look at the physical flow, right? From like a block form. What was your beginning? How much did you purchase? Minus your ending gives you your cost of goods sold. Step two is assign a cost to that, right? And there's four methods you can use, right? The first one we looked at is specific ID, right? If you were able to, if it was a very unique product or special product like a house or jewelry, I know I sold it, you know, I know I sold this specific one and I know that specific one cost me this amount, right? You just literally track what you're selling. Right, because it's you know unique, special. You can do that when it's a very like fungible product, right? Homogeneous, the same nails in a bin, right? Then we're gonna do the best we can given our constraints, right? We're gonna make an assumption uh, for how we're gonna calculate it, and these assumptions, based on the physical flow, can be your FIFO method, your LIFO method, or your average cost method. Right, so FIFO is your first in, determines your cost of goods sold. LIFO is your last in, determines your cost of goods sold. And then your average cost is your average cost, determines cost of goods sold. All right, so with FIFO here, we said the first in is the first out. In other words, your oldest inventory is the first you're gonna grab an expense. So if you grab your oldest and you expense it, what's left over must be your newest stuff. Right, there you go. With LIFO, it's the reverse, right? Your last in is gonna be your first out, right? Your newest stuff is gonna be the first that's expensed. So if we expense your newest stuff, it means what's left over, right? Your ending inventory must be your oldest stuff just the reverse, right? 
average cost, right? What we're gonna do here is, hey, what did you have in total, right? What was your total inventory, your max capacity, your goods available for sale? What did you pay for all of that? We then can figure out on average, what did each unit cost you? Accordingly, afterwards, apply that average times how many you sold versus how many you kept. We rounded that out with talking about uh, which inventory method you should select. Well, first off, you have to understand the dynamics of it. Are prices going up, right? Did one purchase to the next, did the price go up? Is it rising prices? Generally, that's the environment we live in, right? If that's the case, we're gonna have these situations, right? And this is just showing you the specific examples there, right? And then here's a you know, summary chart. We said then that there's a tension, right? Between our net income on our books and records, we want that to be as high as it can be to attract those external investors. But the, the downside of that is uh, we're gonna have to pay taxes on all of that, right? So you have to balance in picking which method you want. What are your goals? We then talked about um, you know, the lower of cost or net realizable value, right? Once you establish your inventory on there, you periodically have to evaluate it and remeasure it, right? Look at what is the lower of the cost you have it on there for or what you can sell it for, um, you know, backing out any selling fees, right? And that's a conservatism principle. The idea is we don't really want to be overstating our inventory on our balance sheet, right? We have to be fair in what it's really worth. Talked about errors in inventory, right? We said they correct out over two years, like the net effect of them. And then we looked at the inventory turnover ratio. So with that, right, we're going to end the lecture here. Uh, this one, this chapter is like, if you could understand the theory of it in the PowerPoint, that's great. It will make more sense when we do the problems, right? It's kind of like building a puzzle, right? We, you have to like sort it into different buckets and then apply the rules. Just hearing about it is fine, right? It kind of gives you an idea. But once we start you know, using examples and you know, analyzing it, it will make more sense then. So I'm going to end the lecture here for the PowerPoint for chapter seven.